Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a privilege to be able to speak on the, the story, the account of the life of Joseph, because Joseph is many people's favorite Bible story. Uh, so many things happened to him, you could almost write a musical about him, couldn't you? All right, for those of you a bit slow, they did. But um, his life was a series of, of ups and downs. He came from a very, very faithful family, a family, uh, I'm being ironic now, without any internal problems. If you think about it, you think about uh, Joseph's background, his grandfather, his great-grandfather was Abraham. Well, he didn't have any problems, did he? I mean, he had a son, he had a wife, Sarah, and he had a son through Sarah of Isaac. So what could go wrong there? Well, there was also Hagar and Ishmael, and all the problems that are there. Now, God is working out his promises through people with problems, and it's the faith that wins through at the end. Anyway, then Isaac um, gets married. Isaac wouldn't have any problems, would he? Well, his two sons were twins, Esau and Jacob. And if you remember the difference between the two, God sums it up by saying, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Within, even within that particular family, there was, those, there was the one side of the family, Esau, that wanted to go against the things of God, which we'll see briefly in a bit. And we've got the things that Jacob wanted to follow, the things of God. So then we come to Jacob. Now surely by the time we get to Jacob, he won't have any problems, will he, in his family life? Well, massively so. You've just read those words together in chapter 37 about how much Joseph was hated. He was hated, he was despised, he was envied, which I suggest to you is even worse than being hated. The, the, the order of events, the way things come in chapter 37. Um, somebody once described the difference between envy and jealousy. Um, I'm not saying this is a, a correct understanding of the words, but I think it is c correct scripturally. To be jealous of something is to want something that somebody else has and it's not always a bad thing we can be jealous of good works for example we could be jealous wanting to be, have what other abilities other people have god is jealous when somebody else gives somebody else another false god the glory that he should get but envy is a bit different jealous is to want what somebody else has to be envious is to want what somebody else has but not want them to have it to, to take it from it and what was it that of course Jesus was betrayed for he was despised and betrayed for envy he was put to death because of envy that the people of the day the religious leaders of the day couldn't stand the fact that Jesus had all of this ability and this this um, uh, magnetism with his audience and with the people who followed him so they thought well if if we can't have what he's got we'll take it off him and that's why he was put to death and now amongst other things the same applies to the man Joseph now a simple question to ask, especially if you come back with me to chapter 29, we'll stay in the book of Genesis, and I can't possibly do justice on the story of Joseph in one talk, um, but we'll do our best. Why was Joseph so loved? Because you saw there in chapter 37, he's there with his coat, he's, he's the special one, that's the particular way it looked to the other brothers. Well, it goes back initially, first, it goes back to two things, really. It goes back to the love that um, Jacob had for Rachel, Joseph's mother. But it also goes back to another thing, which I think is linked to Abraham and Isaac. It goes back to the fact that Jacob loved the things of God. Jacob wanted the promises that had been promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to him. And I believe, and it doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong, but it seems to me anyway, that Jacob, that Jacob believed that the promises would pass through the firstborn son. And in his mind, the firstborn son was Joseph. That's what it seems like that to me. And that's why he gave him the particular coat. But anyway, moving back. And we have um, chapter 29, verse 9. While he, Jacob, spake with the people, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, her mother, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother. That's relevant, by the way, because the, the difference between Esau and Jacob, as I said before, Jacob wants to do the things of God, and Esau wants to go completely in the opposite direction. So Esau goes off with strange women of false religions, but Jacob is told by his father, go to you know, my house, go to my family where they worship God truly. And he, he meets here, he meets uh, Rachel at the house, as it were, the family of Rebecca's um, 
brother as it were the mother is Laban his mother's brother that Jacob went near verse 10 and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban his mother's brother and Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept now brothers young men imagine what was it like when you first met your wife it was the first thing he did oh look there she is and he, he ran to her and he gives her a kiss and he's absolutely over. he knew instantly this is the one and she knew too I'll ask you girls, what was the first thing you did when you met your husband? Did you run home and tell dad? I think my wife was a bit worried to tell her who, who, she was, who she'd met, but there you go. This is what he, she does. Verse 12, and Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother. They understood the significance of that, the religious connections and family, and that he was Rebecca's son, and she ran and told her father, I've met the man of my dreams. And he's of faith. That's key anyway uh, jumping through the passage um laban the father of rachel and leah uh, is happy for, for for jacob to marry but there is a certain rule that went on in the middle east which still applies in other countries today i used to have a customer who unfortunately um died last year suddenly at the one week before she retired age 59 she was, dread, she was really looking forward to her um, retirement and she dropped dead suddenly of a brain hemorrhage. And she said to me one day, she was telling me all about her relationship with her husband, which was a terrible problem for all of her life. She was Indian. And uh, I said to her one day, I said, Did you, have you never loved, all I'd ever heard was a whinging about her husband. Have you never loved your husband? She said, no, I've never loved. I said, well, what did you marry him for then? She said, well, you don't understand. I said, no, I, I don't, enlighten me. She said, well, in our culture, the eldest daughter has to marry first. I said, right. She says, I have an older sister. And my sister was in love. And she wasn't allowed to marry until I married. So I agreed to marry him so that my, she loved her sister that much that she was prepared to marry somebody else. It's the same here. In the culture, the older of the two girls was to marry first. Anyway, that's exactly what happened. They, they have this uh, event, as it were. It says there, um, Jacob, verse 18, well, verse 17, Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favoured, which is a, a phrase which is virtually identically, which is incorrect English, isn't it, used to describe Joseph later on. Joseph, I think Joseph had the, the beautiful character and physical appearance of his mother. And by the way, I think that's relevant that when Jacob sees, I'm jumping forward now a long time, when Jacob, Jacob meets Joseph many years later, who does Jacob meet when he meets his son? He meets his son. But he recognises his wife too, who died some years before. It was quite a touching moment, similar in appearance. But anyway, verse 18, And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. So he's prepared to, to work for her for seven years, to, for, for Laban for seven years to get her. And Laban said, it is better that I should give her to thee than I should give her to another man, abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her, for her. So he, he loves her that much, he's prepared to work for seven years so that at the end of seven years he can marry her. You may or may not know the account. He's tricked on the wedding day. They have a feast, a bit like a certain king did in another book of the Bible, where lots of alcohol presumably is involved. And he's tricked. And the following morning when he wakes up, actually, he's married Leah. He wanted to marry Rachel. And he's married Leah. So he then is prepared to serve longer. Initially, I think, he was thinking of serving another seven years to get Rachel to wife. But anyway, it happens quicker than that so this is why we get to the point why why joseph was so loved because joseph was from rachel but also why jacob joseph was so despised and hated and i go back to the point i made before that it seems to me that jacob thought the promises to abraham to isaac and to his himself from god were surely going to go through joseph because that's the way it worked before. When God said through Abraham, no, 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 it's the firstborn of your proper wife that's going to be the firstborn. Not from Hagar, but from Sarah, and Isaac, and so on. He seems to be of that mind. Anyway, moving on. Verse 31 of chapter 29. We here get, um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go through this quickly, but we get the, the lists of the children that are born to Leah, Bilhah, 
Zilpah, and then eventually, right at the end, onto Rachel. Rachel is put through this difficult period where Leah is having all the children, or handmaids are having children, but she's not having children, and she has to wait. She's been put in a difficult position. God works in the ways of men, doesn't he? Verse 31. And when the Lord saw that Rachel was hated, it's unfortunate in this account, it happens all the time. They are, hatred keeps coming through the story, as does envy, in that order. When the Lord saw that Rachel, Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. In other words, by definition, he opened the womb of Leah and closed the womb of Rachel. It's a deliberate, deliberate. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called, notice that, she called his name. In all of the children, bar one, the mother names the children. It's only the very last child to be born, which is Benjamin. And what, was it, what did the mother want to call him? Not Benjamin. We'll come back to that later. The mother wanted to call him son of my sorrow, Benoni. And eventually when we get to the twelfth son, Jacob says, no, 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 he doesn't say that, but I'm naming this one, son of my right hand. This son's not going to leave my side. I think that's what he's saying. Anyway. So she calls him Reuben. And I'm going to be quite graphic at this. What, what the word Reuben means is, she's, the, the word Reuben means, see, I've got a son. That's what Reuben means. Leah is saying, I've got a son. My husband is Jacob. Rachel, what have you got? I've got a son. She then has another child. Um, uh, well, actually, you read in her own writing in the, towards the end of verse 32, because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also, the second one, and she called his name Simeon. Because the Lord has heard that I'm hated. So she calls his a second son hearing. Simeon. God has heard that I'm hated. So the second so look, I, I think this is what she's saying, Rachel. See, I've got a son, Rachel. You haven't. I have. God has heard me that I'm hated, so I'm going to call him hearing. She then gives him a third. God gives him a third. Verse 34. She conceived again and bare a son and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me. Now this time, hang on, this is the third, so now this time will my husband be joined unto me. What's that mean? Well, it means this. She knew full well that Jacob loved Rachel. And she's saying, surely he'll treat me like the wife now. Surely. And if, you, if, if you're not sure about what I'm saying, if you're not convinced, then go through the book of Genesis and see who Jacob refers to as his wife. Rachel. Rachel. We'll that might come out a bit later. So, now this, time, now this time will my husband be joined unto me. So she calls his name Levi, which means joining. Playing with the names. And she conceived again and bare a son. And she said, now I will praise the Lord. I'm going to praise the Lord because I've got four sons now. I'm going to call him praise. And she called his name Judah, which means praise. And then she left bearing. Chapter 30, verse 1. And Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children. She envied her sister. You might not have noticed it when we read it, but when we read chapter 37, Jacob was, Joseph rather, was hated by his brothers, and then he was envied by his brothers. He was hated because of his dreams, and he gets worse and worse and worse. He'd hate him even more, and then they envy him. Well, if we can't have what he's got, we're going to take it off him. So she says to Jacob in verse 1, Give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel and said, Am I in God's stead? It's, it's not me that's stopping it happening, is it? So she says, Behold my maid Bilhah, go in unto her, and she shall be bear upon my knee. So in other words, Bilhah, um, Rachel's maid, would have children. And Rachel then, in verse 6, call, names the child. Rachel said, God hath judged me, and also hath heard my voice. So she's naming the children based on her relationship with her father and with her husband. God hath judged me and heard my voice and hath given me a son. Therefore she is called, she called his name Dan, which means to judge. 
Verse 7, and Bilhah's maid, Rachel's maid, conceived again, and Jacob bare a second son, and Rachel said, with great wrestling have I wrestled with my sister. You see what's in her mind? For those of you who've had children, were you most obsessed when you gave birth about, about your relationships with your aunties and uncles and your brothers and sisters? Is that how you chose to name the child? <laughs> well, she does. With great wrestling, I've wrestled with my sister, therefore I'm going to call his name Wrestling. I'm going, to, I'm going to shove that in Rachel's face every day as well. Look, I've wrestled with you and I've won. I'm winning. So she calls him Naphtali, which means wrestling. Verse 9. When Leah saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her Jacob to wife. And Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a son. And Leah said, A troop cometh. And she called his name Gad. Now this is what she's saying, which I think is, I think is quite hurtful. She's saying, Leah is saying through Zilpah, her maid, look at all the children I've had. And how many have you got? Oh, none of your own. Oh, sorry. Well, look at me. I've got a troop of them. I've got loads of them. So she calls the child Troop Gad. And then she has another one. Verse 13. Happy am I, for the daughter shall call me blessed, when I, because I've got all of these children. And she calls his name Asher, which means happy. Look at me, look at, look, at, look at what I've got and look what you haven't got, Rachel. Now, I'm not having a go particularly at Leah here. That's a separate subject. But you can, what I'm really saying is this. Can you see the internal family turmoil between one side and the other? It's real pressure. Verse 18. Leah said, God hath given me my hire. I'm getting what I deserve because I have given my maiden to my husband. And she called his name Issachar. My, 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 my reward, I'm getting what I deserve. And then last of all, of those sons to her, verse 20, Leah said, God hath endued me with good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me. Don't you think it's time that Jacob realized now I've given him through me, I've given him all of these sons. All right, Rachel's given some through Bilhah, but I've given them through my birth and through my, my handmaid. Now will my husband dwell with me because I have borne him six sons and she called his name Zebulun, which means to, to dwell with. Then afterwards she had a daughter and called her name Dinah. And it's same again, same thing. Look, God's judged me. He's given me a child again. What's, she done to, what's God done for you, Rachel? The, the, the internal pressures is really quite sad. But then verse 22... And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her, and opened her womb, and she conceived and bare a son, and said, God hath taken away my reproach. You see, the first thing that's bothering her when she's giving a ch having a child, at last God's taken away my reproach. She's not saying, thanks be to God for the wonderful things that he's done. She's talking about the relationship that she has with Leah, really. And she calls his name Joseph. Now, Joseph is the first name in the Bible, I believe, where God's name is part of the name. And it means God is adding. Because she's adding. Uh, it, the, what she's saying is in naming Joseph. Saying, she says, she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. The first thing she's bothered about when giving birth, about naming a child, is that she gets another one. She wants another one. Then another one. Because Leah's got all of these. I want more. Unfortunately, we have to be very careful what we ask God for. She asked God for another son. How many more do you think she'd get? Another son. She gets one more. And she dies in childbirth. You get what you ask for sometimes. And you shouldn't ask for it. So, anyway, we come then to chapter 37, um, which is the account that we read. And we see there the, the terrible way in which Joseph was, was treated. Um, jo jo it wasn't Joseph's fault all of the background it wasn't Joseph's fault that he was capable and wise and full of the spirit of God as, as is such but we then read before, well before we get to chapter 37 just look briefly at chapter 36 just scan through chapter 36 and look at all those names and what it says about them you know Duke Korah Duke Gatam Duke Dishon I'm just that's the chapter all about Esau and chapter 36 is all about, well, chapter, verse 1 of chapter 36 sums it up. Now, these are the generations of Esau. Esau and Jacob had separated, and, and Esau wasn't interested in the things of God, and Jacob was interested in the things of God. Chapter 36 is all about Esau. Look at me, how big and powerful I am. I've got all of this land. I've got all of these people. I've got everything that I need. I don't need the birthright. I don't need the blessing. I don't need the promises of God. I've got everything I need. 
But look at the contrast between chapter 36 of Esau and the first couple of verses of chapter 37 with Jacob. Chapter 37 with Jacob, verse 1, Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph. As far as Jacob was concerned, the whole of the future that mattered to him, or so he thought, and he was wrong to think it, surely was through Joseph. Everything that, all the promises are surely going to come through Joseph. He's the one that I love. He's the firstborn of Rachel. He's the one I'm going to give the special coat to. The ketanet, or the, the, the coat of uh, the high priest, the garments, or whatever it's called. And he was 17 years of age. And we have to remember that. And some people unwisely suggest that Joseph was a little bit pompous or whatever. They're, they're wrong. There's no words in the scripture that suggest he was. It wasn't his fault that he could interpret dreams. God had allowed him to do so. It wasn't his fault that he had more knowledge and wisdom of the things of God than the others. That's what he wanted out of life. And that's why he was despised, because of his parentage and, and other things. So he's given a coat of many colours, verse 4. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And this goes on and on, verse 8. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? You know, you're a little one. And they hated him yet more for his words, for his dreams, and for his words. Then he, he then tells this story about the sun and the moon and the stars bowing to him, which Ian in his opening prayer talked about how the brothers would eventually bow down to him. But then we read that in verse 11 after that, and his brethren envied him, but his father observed. What does all of this mean? So they, they throw him into a pit. They treat him terribly. They throw him into a pit, verse 24. They took him and cast him, which means to hurl him into a pit. They didn't gently place him into a pit. Where there was no water. Uh, it was empty. And they sat down to eat bread. And that's ironic. Of all the people within the family that should have been able to join in the meal and eat the same bread, it was Joseph. He was the one. What was the meal that Joseph gave to them later on in the story when they were looking for it? Because they had no food. He gave them bread because they were brothers anyway so they do what they do um, notice in verse um, 26 because even though Reuben was the firstborn Reuben whose name means see a son Reuben was the firstborn but he was actually it would appear quite relatively a gentle character and, and not very bold in committing himself to things because Jacob in his blessing at the end of Jacob's life says Reuben you're as unstable as water you go whichever way you want to go you, you need to be stronger but Judah on the, contra on the other hand seems to be the, the real mouthpiece of the family Judah is the one of opinion. Judah is the one that leads them one way or another. Judah says unto his brethren, verse 26, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? But what's the point of just killing him? And whatever? We might as, well, might as well make some money out of it. There is a Jacob in the New Testament. Only the trouble is because of King James, he's not called it correctly in the New Testament, he's called James. There's no such name as James in the New Testament. It's actually Jacobus, Jacob. Jacob says, he refers to this verse about, if you say you have love and don't give your brothers bread and, and drink and whatever, then what, what, what sort of brother are you? He's referring back to this incident, I think. Anyway, Judah says, what profit is it if we slay our brother? So they sold him, sold, offered to sell him to the Ishmaelites and they were content with that. They get 20 pieces of silver and then they go and tell Reuben finds out and he's beside himself what, uh, beside himself along the lines of well what am I going to do he's worried about himself I'm, I'm the oldest here what am I going to do what, what am I going to say to dad then they go and tell father verse 34 and Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days how many days do you think you would be mourning for your son for the rest of his life if things had gone normally not a few days and that actually takes you back a little bit earlier in the story to Jacob when Jacob left home to find a wife his mother told him to go away quickly because his brother was wanting to kill him Esau 
and his mother Rebecca said to him just go away for a few days until your brother's anger turn away <laughs> how long many days do you think Jacob and Esau's anger between each other would take to get to calm down it still exists God says it's a perpetual, perpetual hatred it'll continue forever anyway so, so Jacob is now devastated all his sons and his daughters rose up to comfort him but he refused to be comforted and he said for I will go down unto the grave unto my son mourning the rest of my life I'll be mourning thus his father wept for him and a Midianite sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar an officer of Pharaoh's and captain of the guard one historian a professor David Roll has suggested in the findings that he's found is that Potiphar wasn't when you know when it says Potiphar an officer of Pharaoh's Potiphar he suggests was the officer that was in charge of the slaughterhouse. He wasn't just a gentle servant, he was in charge of the slaughterhouse. And that doesn't just mean for animals, that means for slaves or whatever that need being put to death. He was sent down into the house of a, this a slaughterhouse onto an officer of Pharaoh's. And the word officer, which is ironic, means eunuch. No wonder his wife had some problems and his some desires towards Joseph who was working in her house but that's a separate subject at that time verse 1 of chapter 38 and this is key to the life of Joseph it came to pass at that time at what time it came to pass at the time and yes Joseph had been sent down to work in the in the in prison as it were to Pharaoh at that time when Jacob was destitute and, and needing help and comfort and all of his sons and his daughters around him helping him at that time Judah goes looking for a woman that's the sort of family Joseph was 17 years of age I am come with me now moving on we'll have to race on because we're going to get towards the end then in chapter 39 we're, we're then in Potiphar's house and all sorts of things happen he is very well thought of he then becomes an expert once again in, in interpreting dreams and Pharaoh then has this situation where he's, he's trying to understand a dream and all of his magicians and experts and whatever couldn't understand the dream and Joseph does and Joseph makes it clear that the dream that Pharaoh had was that God was going to do something with the land there's going to be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine he interprets the dream like that and it seemed to fit they thought Pharaoh agreed and actually in that period of history there is a period of history where the land seemed to be more plenteous than ever before followed by seven years of actual no crops you'd be surprised to learn what caused the lack of crops Torrent torrential rain for nearly seven years so much rain that the crops that they grow in Egypt couldn't grow, grow. But anyway, fair, uh, Joseph in his wisdom, um, put your hands up if you like paying tax. Is that your whole hand up, Joan, or are you just fanning yourself? <laughs> All right, okay. Joseph is the person that introduces tax. You thought it was a chance of the exchequer. Joseph then applies a 20% tax in the seven good years to hold back all the grains. If you have 140% after seven, you work it out, 140% of one year's worth of grain stored up after seven years, so then the next seven years they can divide it out. Absolute brilliance and it's in the second year of the famine that Joseph's family his brothers now need food they now need grain and that's described to in the biblical terms as they now need bread that one thing that they chose to not give Joseph when he needed it they now go into the land to want it now Joseph I'm not going to show you now Joseph is at that point he's 39 years of age He is 30 when he sees Pharaoh, because we're told so quite clearly. There's seven years of plenty, and then in the second year of famine, so it's 31, 32-ish, 39-ish, that's when his brothers come to see him. Now, I'd like you to ask yourself a question. It's a, it's a worthwhile question, but it's one that you might not like. If you've been Joseph, and your brothers have treated you like that, how do you think you'll be with them? now that you're Pharaoh's right hand man you're going to get your vengeance 
This is why Joseph is arguably the best story other than that of Jesus in the whole of the Bible. Because he shows the true character, his own character, the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come with me, if you will, uh, to chapter 44. We're not going to look at it, but I'll just point it out in any detail. I'll point it out to you. Um, there's, there's a verse in Luke's Gospel where Jesus said something about forgiveness. When somebody sins against you, what should you do? Well, when you read Luke 17, he's a little bit more um, thorough in his answer. He says, if thy brother trespass... If, interesting how he says brother. If thy brother trespasses against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Don't just forgive him, because he might not have changed. You've got to rebuke him, because you want him to be in the kingdom of God. If, assuming you're in the right and he's in the wrong, which is another issue if your brother trespasses against you you want him to be in god's kingdom so you want him to you want to see if he's changed now then the next period of the life of joseph he, he goes through a, a series of of, of shiraz, it might say it's obvious in certain parts of the text that he, he doesn't know what to do because he's under a pressure he wasn't expecting his brothers and he's speaking th deliberately through an interpreter and he's no doubt got the, the makeup on or whatever they did in those days and he looks like an Egyptian he sounds like an Egyptian he walks like an Egyptian he is an Egyptian in all sense and purposes sorry you know what you're with me there all right some of you not okay but he's playing with time and as he's playing with time with sacks and cups and whatever he's rebuking them and he can overhear what they're saying because they're speaking in front of him because they think he can't speak Hebrew. And he's finding out what they're like. So he brings them back and we then get to chapter 44, as I said, and is now twisting the knife and seeing where they're at. And then, verse 14, Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house for he was yet there and they fell before him on the ground. They don't know who he is. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? What ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? And Judah said, and this, this is the beginning of the most, um, um, uh, what's the word, pathos, the most emotional speech in the whole of the Old Testament. This is the speech that the Hebrew scholars say it's full of vibrancy and life as desperate because Judah is now about to speak he is desperate for his father he's left his father back in the land they come down in to see Joseph Joseph is not you'll know what I mean by that he is supposedly dead and Jacob his life is as far as Jacob is concerned is bound up that's J Judah's words in the life of Benjamin because surely Jacob's thinking if it's not through Joseph because he doesn't exist anymore it, it must be through Benjamin and he's never going to leave my side that's why he calls him the son of the right hand Benjamin anyway Judah comes near verse 30 at verse 18 I think we should read the whole bit, but we'll see how we get done. Judah came near unto him and said, O my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ears, and let not thine anger burn, burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have ye a father, a brother? And we said unto my Lord, We have a father of an, an old man, and a child of his old age, a little one. He has a child. Hang on. I thought there were twelve sons of Jacob and daughters. Notice how Judah's referring specifically down the line of Rachel. He has a child of his old age, a little one, and his brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. Do you notice how Judah now is sympathetic to Jacob's understanding of rape died already, by the way. And thou saidst unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Just look at the passion that Judah has for dad. Whereas before, he left dad alone when he went looking for some woman. And thou said, verse 23, unto thy servants, except your youngest brother come down with you, you shall see my face no more. And it came to pass when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord, you in other words, Joseph. And our father said, go again and buy us a little food. And we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother be with us, then we will go down. For we may not see the man's face, except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, Ye know that my wife bare me two sons. 
You see Jacob's words? My wife bare me two... I thought he had two wives and two, two servants. He says, you know that my wife bare me two sons, and the one went out from me, Joseph, and I said, surely he is torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. And if ye take this also from me, and mischief befall, befall him, if something happens to him as well, ye shall bring down my grey hairs with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore, says Judah to Joseph, now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us that he will die and thy servant shall bring down the grey hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave for thy servant Judah is saying I became a surety for the lad unto my father saying if I bring him not unto thee then I shall bear the blame forever for my father Judah is changed that's the point I'm making Judah is saying blame me father if anything goes wrong I'll, do, I'll, I'll even die for you father because I want to help you now therefore I pray thee let thy servant abide instead of the lad a bondman to my lord and let the lad go up with his brethren for how shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with us lest peradventure I see the evil that should come upon my father and it's at that point he'd not done it before it's at that point when Judah shows his repentance he'd been rebuked through all this mechanism and he didn't realize what was going on and then Judah repents and when Joseph sees that repentance Joseph can't cope anymore he stood there in his power and he's been in complete control but now we then read this then Joseph could not refrain himself from before all that stood by him and he cried cause everyone to go out from him get out and there stood no man with him while Joseph would made himself known unto his brethren the, the right hand man to Pharaoh alone with 10 Hebrews that was never done you'd always have army men around you but Joseph there with the 10 brothers and he wept aloud and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard and Joseph said unto his brethren I imagine the first words that Joseph says to his brothers I'm Joseph imagine, one, imagine you're one of the brothers gulp uh uh, is my father alive still and his brethren could not answer for they were troubled at his presence they were utterly speechless they normally find it easy to speak but they're utterly speechless and Joseph said unto his brethren come near to me I pray you and they came near and he said I am Joseph your brother whom you sold into Egypt as if they couldn't remember but he's proving that he knows who they are, he is who he is now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye you sold me hither for God did send me before you to preserve life wow verse 15 oh he then gives them the land of Goshen and um, moreover he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them and after that he talked with his brethren I'm going to ask you another question in your own mind do you think Joseph's brethren believed him? I know they believed him that he was their brother, but do you think they believed him that he really had forgiven them? How could he forgive us for what we've done? But he won't do anything to us yet, will he? Because Dad's still alive. That's what they're thinking. Because when Dad's dead, that's surely when they'll do something. Come with me, if we will, to chapter 50. There's a lovely little phrase, actually, that God says, I forgot to go to it, but God says to Jacob, Jacob is now being told by God to go to Egypt. Go into Egypt. Go to that place where I've always told you and your father and your grandfather not to go. Go into Egypt. And, and, and Jacob is a bit worried about it, and he, he has sacrifices, and he's checking that God really wants him to do it. And God says to him, you're going to see Joseph and he's going to put his hands on your eyes I want you to just think about that he's going to put his hands on your eyes I'll tell you what that means the last person you're going to see before you die is Joseph and when you've dead, died He'll put his hands on your eyes 
and close your eyelids. Jacob, says God, you're going to die a happy man. You're going to, everything you wanted in life, you'll realise it's coming to pass. Now this, this takes time. But anyway, we then come to chapter 50. Well, actually, chapter 49, verse 31. He's burying, burying his wife. He's finding the burying place. Verse 31, there they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah. And? By the way, he learnt to love Leah. I once heard somebody say that, he said something, I, I'm a bit contrarian, if you know what I mean, but I once heard somebody say something that I've always agreed with and always believed and said myself, and as soon as somebody else says it, I choose to challenge it. <laughs> and what a chap once said at Halifax meeting, he said, Jacob married the wrong wife. I thought, yes, he did, he, but yeah. He couldn't have done. How could he have married the wrong wife? If God works in the kingdoms of men, how could he marry the wrong wife? No, he didn't marry the wrong wife. He married the right wife that God wanted him to marry. And it took him the rest of his life to work that out. Moving on. Verse 33. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed and yielded up the spirit, up the ghost. He died and was gathered unto his people. And Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him and put his hands on his eyes now this is the challenge now what will Joseph do to us anyway verse 15 when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead they said Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us of all the evil which we did unto him and they sent a messenger, what cowards, they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespasses of thy brethren and their sin. Do you really think that Jacob said that to them? I don't think he would have done, but we don't know. Did Jacob not understand the character of Joseph? Well, his brothers certainly didn't. Why, why would they say, surely, go, you know, are you going to forgive us? He forgave them a while back. He forgave them when he heard Judah's speech. He forgave them when he told them he'd forgiven them. And this is one of the lessons of Joseph, and it's the most important for us. Who is it that forgives us? Do we really believe it? No, really? Do you really believe that you've been forgiven for all of those things? Are you thinking when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to establish his kingdom, whose pleasure it is to give those to the kingdom, do you think he's going to say, well, it'll, it'll condemn me? Well, you misunderstand the character of Jesus, if that's the case. If you love Jesus, and you've lived for Jesus and for the Father, he'll be just the same only better as Joseph was with his brothers Joseph is the best example in a way in the Bible of the character of Jesus he was lovely he was wise he was forgiving he gave life he gave land he gave Goshen and yet he was still feared wrongly Joseph is a man who is an example of Jesus, a wonderful character, and one that you, you can delve into and see all sorts of ramifications of things that were going on, see the way they behaved. He was a truly remarkable man. Even when he was 17, he was a remarkable man. And we follow somebody a lot better.